Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and this is a J.P. Beck engraved, signed, and relief carved smoothbore flintlock American long rifle. John Philip Beck, 1751 to 1811, was active in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and is known to have manufactured a wide variety of firearms, including muskets for the Committee of Safety during the American Revolution, in addition to his well-known long rifles. The Kentucky Rifle Foundation calls him one of the superior builders of Pennsylvania long rifles and notes that he was instrumental in establishing the regional style and his rifles are often embellished with bold Rococo scrollwork and beautiful engraving. This particular rifle is probably relatively early in Beck's work and features a beautifully engraved patch box with a whale tail finial seen on some other Beck rifles, as well as elaborate incised and raised relief carving on the stock. When it comes to firearms history, especially here in America, a lot of people will look to Colt as an icon, but I think before that, you have folks like J.P. Beck. And when I had the opportunity here to take a look at an original Beck smooth rifle like this one, I just had to take it. Beck is one of the fathers of the Pennsylvania long rifle and seeing an original like this one is just an incredible opportunity. What we have here, although it might look like a rifle with its octagonal barrel, long stock, and just all around long rifle look, is actually a smooth rifle. Looking down the muzzle here, you'll notice there, there's no rifling. Now, we can go back and forth with this. Uh, we know that there are some Beck rifles that the bore was worn out, bored out, and it was turned into a smooth rifle. But this one very well could have started out and existed only as a smooth rifle. While many fouling pieces and other smooth rifles of the time featured octagon to round barrels, this one is a straight full octagon and features the front and rear sights like we'd see in a normal rifled long rifle. We're gonna start back here at the butt stock and work our way forward on the lock side, then we'll flip over to the other side. Back here, we just have a classic American patch box here. We have an interesting patch box release. We push it up and you can see there, the patch box is ju just launches out. After all these years, the spring in this patch box still functions flawlessly. The patch box itself, we can see in here, we have a little bit of a notch that comes into this patch box that's still left as wood to support the lid of the patch box, I imagine. The patch box itself is real traditional. We can see the drilled round ends uh, on either side where the patch box was drilled out before it was carved out. Something I like to see and it is neat to see on this piece is we still have some vertical chisel lines where the box was cut and cleaned up with a chisel in here. Like many of these original patch boxes like we see, the inside of this patch box is left unfinished. This is raw wood on the inside. We have maybe a little bit of stain and finish around the lid catch, but other than that, the patch box itself is left plain. Closing the patch box now, we can see the beautiful engraving on the exterior. It's just beautiful engraving here. It, it's not deep, uh, but it is precise and it is established. There aren't any start and stop cuts in the engraving here. It's just beautiful. Although we consider this rifle to be an earlier piece of Beck's work, the skill level on the engraving is still there. It's just magnificent. Behind the patch box, we have a very traditional narrow brass butt plate here. We have five facets on the top here, a single screw on the top, a wedding band cut at the front of the butt plate, and we have a single screw at the rear of the butt plate. Coming forward as we enter our wrist, and I should note here, we have a nice curly piece of maple, I believe, for our stock here. It's concealed a bit by the large patch box we have here, but as we come forward into the wrist and across the cheek rest and the crest of the stock here, we can see a little bit of those curl lines. Coming off of our crest and our wrist, we have a beautiful scroll here kind of flowers out to a simple leaf. This balances out with the nice molding line that we have coming from the toe of the stock up into the trigger guard 
where it terminates nicely turning in to our lock plate. On the underside, the toe of our stock here, we have a beautiful brass trigger guard. Very simple brass trigger guard here. No engraving other than some filed motifs at the front and the rear of the main section of the trigger guard here. And we have some filed flats as well connecting in between. Like many trigger guards from this era, once you get past that trigger and the trigger plate, we have a nice smooth, soft trigger guard. The inlet on the trigger guard and the trigger plate is just magnificent. Even after all this time, it's still nice and flush and just beautiful. We have a very short trigger plate in here inside the trigger guard. Very common for these earlier American long rifles. Uh, I got my tape measure here. At just over about three and an eighth inches long uh, uh, on our trigger plate here. We have a nice fat single trigger here. No real ornate work on this trigger. It terminates with a flat face on the bottom. Coming up to our lock here, we have some carving around our lock face and our lock plate, and we have that unsigned lock. It's, this lock is interesting though, because we have kind of our, our Germanic curve to this lock here a little bit, but it's not a large lock like we see with a lot of early, you know, fat, big locks. We're starting to see the sleek lock architecture that we eventually see start to come in here um, but it's a little bit of a combination of both of those which is interesting to see we have a small flint and a small cock here especially in comparison to our lock plate coming up to the tang of the barrel here we have some beautiful carving coming off of our barrel tang this is really the working area of the piece we have a little bit of where we've lost some wood here behind the cock but it's not detrimental to the overall piece. It's a weak point of end grain on a lot of these muzzleloaders. It's not uncommon to see that chipped away a little bit over time. The condition of the rest of the piece though is just, just wonderful. And I think many of us now expect to see a little wear on a piece like this, especially with the prominence of it. As we come up, we don't have any engraving on the barrel at the breech end until we come up here to the signature a couple inches from the lock where we see the J.P. Beck signature. And farther forward here, we have a beautiful dainty rear sight dovetailed into the top face of the barrel. Just a tiny little sight. It's, it's really beautiful, I think. Again, you can kind of see why Beck was one of you know, the grandfathers of the American long rifle, or the fathers of it, really. Just the, the skill level here is just beautiful. This rear sight, it's just a sight, but its architecture, as it sets into this big, beefy barrel on this long rifle, is just a beautiful note. Coming up to the front here, we have our traditional brass blade front sight. Like many of these pieces that we see through time, we have a very short front sight and a very very short cut into our rear sight. Very minimal sight picture here, but according to the folks that I've talked to, because these rifles were used and carried so much, you didn't want your sights snagging and bumping into things as you're going through the woods on a hunt. You wanted these low profiles, and because they were used and carried so much through time, the owner of this piece could pick up, get onto that narrow sight picture, and be fine. Coming up to the muzzle end here, we have a brass nose cap. Simple, elegant, you know, it's an American long rifle. You're getting what you're getting, you know, just the beauty of it. We have a smooth bore in here, but checking it with my tape measure, this is a 50 caliber. So despite it being a smooth bore muzzleloader, we still have a 50 caliber bore in here. No rifling, but still a common caliber for the time, which I think is interesting to note. Turning it again into its underside here, coming off of our lock plate and our trigger guard and our side plate face, we have some simple incised carving here, kind of reflects and, and flows really into the entry pipe carving that we have around here. Again, these are simple lines, not really deep relief carving on this piece. Much like our trigger guard, the ramrod pipes are simple, in their decoration. They have a, a wedding band on either end and they have faces filed into the center area. Coming back to our entry pipe, very similar decoration, but I want to make a note for you 
is we have some wear in this wedding band. A lot of these pieces, you'll feel that that area of wear is from where the piece was carried. So I imagine if we pick this up where that entry pipe is, I'm not really torquing it one way or the other. That is a balance point. So that wear at that point, I can believe is from the original owner and how they carried this rifle day to day. And that would balance into the wear that we see on that entry pipe. A little bit of the wood itself, but we can also see here just behind that rear sight that there's a bit of wear on the facets of these barrels where it's not as clean and tight as we see up between the sights and back here towards the breech. And we can see that imprint of the original people who carried that in this piece, which I just geek out over that stuff. It, when you can see wear on a rifle, on an original muzzleloader, especially something like this that was signed by Beck himself, built by Beck, and then you can see how somebody could have carried it, how they did carry it through that wear pattern, it's just awesome. You know that you're holding history here when you're, you can find those notes on a piece like this. Flipping it around here, I want to give you a sense of what the other side looks like. What comes to mind is just understated. In the forestock area here, we have our simple molding cut into the ramrod channel, terminating in some nice scroll work around our entry pipe and one of our pinholes here. The side plate itself is left pretty much naked. I have to wonder, was that a decision uh, by Beck himself or maybe by the budget of the owner who was having this built? maybe commissioned, didn't necessarily have the extra funds to add a lot of fancy engraving to the side plate and the lock plate. And uh, it was left plain, possibly just out of, out of practicality there and budget constraints. But we still do see some ornate carving as we come back here away from the side plate side. And really this is where we start to see Beck's excellence once again. We have beautiful carving here in front of the cheek rest. We have a nice line cut here that wraps around the front of the crest of the stock back here. It flows into the cheek rest. We have a simply cut cheek rest with a couple molding lines going in there that balances out with that classic C scroll carving back here on the butt stock where we just have beautiful ornate dainty lines cut all the way through here. It's just a beautiful piece. This is just a prime example. If you're out there and you're wanting to build a nice long rifle that is of the Beck period, this is the kind of carving that you're going to see replicated in books and in contemporary builders for the last 200 years trying to emulate this decoration here. This is just the iconic sea scroll carving right here. Coming back to the wood grain a little bit, we have a little bit of curl. We can see that grain structure back here in the cheek face side, uh, but really it's, it's pretty plain and, and we're left to, to see the carving speaking for itself back here. Now on this side, as we come up in front of the lock and the lock plate here, we see that curl as we come up into the forestock where I have these sharp maple lines of this, you know, the classic maple stocked American long rifle here. It's just a, a neat piece of history whenever I, I have a chance to hold on to and, and to show you at home something from an iconic builder like Beck. I just, I hope that, uh, I hope I can do it justice really because this is just a, a neat piece of history that is, is just wonderful to, to be able to show you. I'm gonna flip it around here and, and shoulder a little bit. Again, my hand kind of naturally goes to that point where uh, we can see that wear on the barrel and the, uh, and the ramrod entry pipe there. Not wear in a bad sense, but just wear that you know another human was carrying this and holding this 200 years ago. And that's just a, a connection point, I think, that if you're into history, it's hard to find that elsewhere. Granted, I have good lighting here where I'm filming, but the, the short sight picture and the really you know mundane sights that we have here, not very prominent, but with proper lighting, I can see that front bead and I can position that very naturally. It allows me to almost point and shoot, um, which I don't think a lot of people necessarily think about when it comes to muzzle loaders, but it's really natural.
the cheek well just allows my face to get right in line with that sight. I mean, everything just, it just fits. Everything about it is just right. And you know, it's like today when, when you're thinking about modern, modern rifles, uh, you know, it's kind of built for everybody. And it's all machined, you know, it's engineered that way, mass produced that way. But when we think back to somebody like Beck building one of these by candlelight and by window light, for something to fit so naturally, it's just beautiful. It's just a work of art. And, you know, being somebody 200 years later, it's, uh, it's really cool that it fits and it lines up and it just works. That's, uh, that's just the beauty of a well-made of a well-made long rifle, I think. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to see this original Beck long rifle here and, uh, and to have the opportunity to share it with you. I know I can't do it justice for, uh, for seeing it in person, but um, I hope that you've gained maybe a little insight into this original piece. So I encourage you to visit the Rock Island Auction. They have a lot of really neat pictures and documentation to go along with these original pieces. Their photographers are much better than I am. So if you'd like to see more up close details of these, please check them out and follow their social media pages as they're continually posting information and beautiful photographs about original muzzleloaders, just like this one. Um, I encourage you to do so if you're a fan of Beck's work and maybe looking to reproduce some of them on your own. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.